Okay, we're live. Let's get started. Sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties. Georg, are you ready to start? Um, are we, sorry, I'm, I'm just a little confused. Are we now using the computer or the phone? We're using the computer and we're live. The session is live right now. Okay, gotcha. Um, well then, sorry, my, my headphone is not wanting to cooperate. But I want to welcome everyone to our topic today. Um, talk about succession planning. Uh, put a disclaimer up front that we will be using open source as our uh, the way we talk about open source. And but we do recognize that the free software movement is important and um, has an important contribution to make. And there's an overlap, but we'll be using open source. Now, I've personally been part of open source for 15 years now, and what I'm observing is that early members of the open source movement are getting to an age where they are going to retire soon. And this was also talked about yesterday in the keynote with Dirk and Linus. And so this is what this session today is about. Um, how do we make sure that on the one hand, we can carry forward the legacy and the movement, uh, while on the other hand, inviting in new people and get them up to speed on the values and how open source works and everything. And we want this to be an open dialogue with everyone on this session. And um, while only one of us can speak at a time, we invite you to write in the chat, ask questions in the Q&A window, and we will get to those throughout the session. We would like to introduce ourselves now. Um, I'm Georg Link. Um, oh, just so that you're aware, we will be upfront about our identities and biases in our background. So if our introductions sound a little different from what you're used to, that is because we want to be as transparent as possible because that um, has impact on how we do a succession planning. So my name is Georg Link. I'm a cisgender gay white male, 30 years old. I grew up in Germany and an immigrant in the United States. Um, I've been privileged throughout my growing up. My parents have been able to give me a lot of opportunities. And my mission is to help open source projects and organizations become more professional in their use of metrics and analytics. So I do this through my work in the Chaos Open Source Project and as Director of Sales of Viturgia. I already shared why I think succession planning is important and I'm passing it on to Maria to introduce herself. Hi, uh, my name is Maria Cruz. Uh, I'm a cisgender, white, gay female. I'm 33 years old. Uh, I was born and raised in Argentina and I emigrated to the US almost five years ago. And I've been privileged, uh, similar to Georg, in that my parents were able to support me throughout my studies and I, I didn't have to work when I was in university. Um, my personal mission is to uh, support and the represented groups to join up open source projects uh, and contribute from their unique life experiences. Uh, I started my career in open source uh, almost like in 2013, so yeah, seven years ago uh, when I started working for the Wikimedia movement. Uh, doing community engagement for learning and growth. And now I am a program manager in the Google Open Source Program Office, where I focus on community engagement for cloud native uh, projects. And the reason why uh, succession planning is important to me is because I think there are already so many voices that are missing in open source. And I think that if we are able to look at this from a diversity lens, we could bring on more collaborators and contributors to the open source movement. Uh, and I think 
With that, I'm going to pass it on to Michael. Thanks, Maria. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Downing, and I am a cisgender middle-aged white man. Um, I was born and raised in a small town uh, in the United States, uh, later attended engineering school and graduate school, uh, and then spent time working with and, and living in the developing world, uh, specifically Western Africa, um, and I've been doing that over the past decade or so. Uh, so I'm back now in the U.S., and my day job is the Director of Community for the Dial Open Source Center at the United Nations Foundation. Um, our work there is really focused around growing and supporting open source communities, um, working in activism, humanitarian response, international development um, with the goal of making them both more sustainable and more impactful. Uh, before I did this, I helped lead an open source project called OpenMRS, which is a health IT uh, platform designed for the, de the developing world and really helped guide it from kind of a stealth research project into more of a grassroots volunteer driven community. And so succession planning is really important to me. Um, and in our work, we've experienced a lot of projects really not reach their full potential um, or at worst be kind of an undeserved failure, uh, mostly because of things like burnout or changing organizational priorities. Uh, a lack of inclusivity and, and software feature design, all of those things factor in. Um, and we've seen projects start to kind of scratch an itch uh, that a developer may have, um, but then suddenly become bigger and really more critical as other people kind of latch onto it. And so this means maintainers and founders often, they're not ready to think about things like long-term plans or sharing leadership with other people. Um, the good news, and I think we'll talk about this today, is there's a lot of uh, not too painful culture shifts that you can really take and uh, start to change how a project can look at succession planning, um, in my mind, through the lenses of sustainability and through growth. Uh, so I'll toss it over to Dawn, um, who will join us as well. Dawn? Yeah, so I'm Dawn Foster. I'm Director of Open Source Community Strategy in VMware's Open Source Program Office. I'm also on the governing board and I'm a maintainer for the Chaos Project. I'm a cisgender, white, 49-year-old woman who grew up in a rural farming community in Ohio. I now live in London. I've been privileged to have been able to get a computer science degree that allowed me to travel the world, not right now, but before, while doing interesting work in the technology industry. And I've been worried about what I like to refer to as the aging problem in open source communities for quite a while now. I'm, let's face it, I'm getting pretty close to retirement. and. I look around within the communities I've been involved in and a lot of the leaders and contributors are people, they're around my age and they're also starting to think about retirement in not that many years. But succession planning is not just about age, right? People change jobs, they get burned out, they become ill, or in the worst case, you know, somebody could die unexpectedly. And it's human nature to ignore or put off these really painful topics because we don't want to talk about them. But if we haven't done a good job of succession planning while the project and the people are healthy, then we're going to be scrambling to pick up the pieces when something unexpected happens. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Georg. Awesome. Thank you very much for being on the panel today. I really appreciate you bringing your experiences to the table and to the conversation. We would like now to start the conversation and I invite everyone in the audience to please write us your questions and comments and um, to have that conversation with us as best as we can. Uh, I see the first one coming in, so this is great. Um, to start the conversation um, and diving into the things that are being done and what we can do, we thought it would make sense to unpack what the problem is with the lack of succession planning and what that can lead to. And I know we have a little bit alluded to this already. So the question that I would like to pass on to the other panelists is, what does it look like to have a lack of succession planning for the open source movement? So on one hand, we can have succession planning in individual projects, but then also we have the open source movement. So what does that look like? Um, 
I, I think the problem uh, with succession planning is very similar to the problem uh, of lack of diversity in open source. Uh, I think that if there is no data or strategy to address uh, this missing participation, um, we are at the risk of, of project burnout, uh, founder burnout and uh, projects becoming stagnant as well. Uh, and then I think one of the saddest, I mean, other than the lack of participation, one of the saddest consequences is that the, the software that we're all building together uh, doesn't really reach its full potential. Yeah, I, I'd like to add something there to Maria's really great points. Um, and you mentioned uh, burnout can happen in a lot of areas, right? It can. We're all familiar with maintainer burnout, either personally or uh, firsthand or, or through other of our colleagues. But um, often, I think funders and other people who are supporting open source projects can also get burnt out. And I think that's a really good point, Maria. Um, in, in our world, in the nonprofit world, uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, the organizations and governments that fund open source projects that are used by either their own governments or by charities. And we've seen them have a lot of concern about um, this kind of burnout or, or projects just kind of fade away um, as the interest wanes. Um, and so, you know, part of our work is really trying to uh, amplify the, uh, the inclusivity, amplify the participation in those projects um, to help avoid that. Because when a project, uh, you know, kind of fades away or, or, or the velocity slows down, um, in our world, it can really lead to a, a risk uh, to individuals and like the beneficiaries of the programs and services that are out there in the developing world or in charitable situations um, who are really relying on open source projects uh, to get that work uh, delivered or get those services delivered to them. And so it's really important to have healthy communities and um, and having a kind of a line of succession um, set up where a lot of different individuals can help contribute to leadership and a lot of different organizations can help um, is a really good factor too. Yeah, and you touched on in the question about um, the movement and the way I see, I see the open source movement as kind of a collection of projects. So I think this is one of those things, succession planning and mentoring and all the things that go along with it are things you address at the project level, which then sort of boils up to more at the, the movement level, just to tie those pieces together. Those are all great points. And how do we, so we, we understand a little bit better what it looks like to not have succession planning. Um, is there a way to maybe have some metrics or some objective uh, measures that we can say, hey, look, this project is lacking succession planning. Um, have you seen something in the wild that could help us um, to make an objective case, hey, this is something that is not happening, we should do it. Yeah, one of the things that I look at from you know, so I've been looking a lot at our VMware originated open source projects and doing metrics around those. And one of the things that I look at is how many people are regularly making contributions to a particular repository, to a particular project. Um, and so sometimes referred to as the bus factor. I think in another presentation this week, I saw it referred to as the truck factor. Um, it's also called the pony factor. But it's basically, do you have enough um, core contributors that the project could survive if something happened to a single person or a small number of people. And I think it's important for us to look at that. And I think it's important for us to, to measure what the, what the contributor risk looks like. So how many people do you have contributing on a regular basis to a project? And is it, is it enough that the project would be okay if something happened to one of them? And I also see this as an opportunity. So, so one of the things you can look at these numbers and you can see this as an opportunity to mentor other people. So maybe two people are doing most of the contributions and then there's a sort of tail of other people who are making a few contributions. And if you only have one or two people that are making most of the contributions, this really is an opportunity to mentor these other people who are just making a few contributions and bring them into the core of the project and have them contribute more and move into leadership positions, which is really what you need to do for succession planning. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that uh, with Don in that it's it's very important to to build metrics and to build metric collection processes that allow us to listen to learn 
and understand what the situation is. And uh, going back to who are the voices that are missing today from open source, um, one initiative that addresses this uh, at Google is the Next Billion User um, Initiative. Uh, they they actually uh, they focus on uh, understanding how people are coming online and what their usage of technology is and and developing different uh, tools to help everybody build uh, better tech for everybody so that uh, everybody can access it for whatever needs they have. Uh, so I think having these kinds of insights is is really important to be able to make technology accessible to everyone. Yeah, I would just add um, the yeah the the work that Google has done here with the uh, with the digital confidence toolkit and the other the other things that they're looking at in terms of getting people connected and and getting them access to tech um, is really something of high value for us in in our world in our nonprofit world um, in international development especially um, and it's funny because often. You'll hear things like nonprofits kind of are trailing behind in technology and things, um, but and it's true when it comes to the kind of open source analytics and community health analytics. Um, but the good news is that they've long been comfortable um, in the nonprofit space of measuring impact of programs. And so what we've been able to do is kind of leverage that type of language and that type of thinking to uh, say, okay, now open source is part of your supply chain. Uh, you're using that as part of the, the tools that you're using to get services delivered to people. And so we need to understand the risks uh, that are kind of deep there in your supply chain. And so we've been able to start to have that conversation with, uh, with the important people to make sure that they invest the time and energy to, to do those metrics and do those analytics on, on community health. Um, and the good news is there's lots of good projects out there like like Chaos uh, that, that Georg works on um, and others that can kind of give us guidance on how to do that so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, but ultimately for us, it's about you know identifying high potential projects that maybe they just need a little bit of an extra push uh, to become more inclusive and to become more stable um, and to have a good uh, you know long-term uh, future uh, ahead of them with lots of leaders and coming from diverse backgrounds. And for us, it's all about kind of reducing that risk of failure again. Excellent. Thank you. It's really not, really good to know what it is that we need to look towards to understand what projects are, um, are possibly missing this uh, succession planning. Now, I want to take some questions from the audience. Uh, Georg, it looks like your audio is cutting out again. My audio is okay. Now you're um, back. Let's yes, try it again. Audio. If not, I'll ask the question. Thank you. The so I want to now go towards asking about how does this actually look doing succession planning? And Ariel asked a question that is very practice practical of whether a fear of change is uh, exists by those leaders that are transitioning. Okay, Georg is breaking up again. So is there a fear of change by the existing transitioning out leaders when planning for succession? I would say uh, I've got some firsthand experience here and I would say uh, often, <laughs> um, and it's going, to, it's going to vary depending on the culture um, from what I've seen. But in many cases, when you have kind of a, a single founder style open source project where it was either one person or just a small number of people, um, you get this, uh, you know, what management people call the founder's dilemma often at play there, where they're kind of really nervous or reluctant to kind of give up control and kind of let go and put things in the hands of others as they grow. And so part of that, um, can can come into play when you start having those conversations initially, um, and so I think fear fear of change is is uh, a valid reaction for folks to have. Um, and in some cases that I've seen, uh, people have kind of written succession plans where you have kind of a phase out or a mentorship role, where the person that's coming in to take over um, has a chance to build a relationship of their predecessor um, and kind of get that relationship and, and that trust built up, and for the the person who came before before to kind of transfer some of the knowledge. Knowledge and, and practices that they have. And hopefully that, uh, what we've seen, it tends to kind of ease the fear of that transition happening. Um, but again, you have to plan for it and you have to realize that that takes some time. 
Yeah, one of the things we talk about a lot in the Kubernetes community is how we can make it seem like a good idea for maintainers to step down and bring someone new in their place when they just don't have time because it's really hard to get people to let go and one of the things we've done a little bit within Kubernetes is we you know we started to put emeritus fields in in some of the leadership spots so they're not they're not completely going away they're sort of there as an advisor if somebody has questions but they're no longer responsible um, for things on a day-to-day -day basis but they still keep a little bit of that status which is really hard to give up in open source communities yeah I I, I, I definitely see that um, because I think it's hard to break in sometimes in some open source projects and, and build techno social capital as it is called sometimes uh, within a project and build uh, build, build uh, reputation as well. Uh, but I definitely, I mean, uh, from my experience working uh, with the Wikip with Wikipedia, uh, I definitely thought that there was fear of change. And I, I just wanted to say that in a way it's understandable because of what Don was pointing out about losing all of these. Uh, uh, experience that I was able to uh, that anyone was able to to build for themselves in a project and reputation I think the other factor uh, to understand that fear is uh, that sometimes certain models work really well and uh, changing can can alter that so um, I, I, there's a saying in the Wikimedia movement that uh, Wikipedia is uh, not supposed to is works in theory but not in practice and it actually works in practice and i i am so I, I guess what i'm saying is i understand where the fear is coming from but i think that uh making space for mentoring and making space for uh, other contributors to to mentor and teach others how to become good contributors is really important in this sense So oh, thank you. thank you. I hope my audio is back to normal. Um, Don, you touched on Kubernetes. Uh, Josh Burkus was asking also about Kubernetes and whether in a, in this huge distributed project with many specialized areas, um, specialized knowledge required there. Um, do you have any advice on detecting and ameliorating these tiny areas of concentration? Yeah, that really is super hard because in a lot of cases, um, the metrics aren't going to be that granular because it might be just like a little tiny area of the code base that only one person knows really, really well. And it's it's really hard to get metrics that that help you understand uh, contribution at that level. I think it's I think it's possible. So I think you can do some of this with metrics, but I think you also need to apply some some kind of human filter on that. Right? You need to talk talk to people and understand um, the work that they're doing, which is really hard in a large project like Kubernetes. But I think it really, I do think it really boils down to encouraging people, especially people with this niche specialized knowledge to to mentor people and, and bring them up so that more people, more people have this knowledge. And that's incredibly hard because mentoring takes like loads of time um, and it can be really hard for people who are very busy. Um, and I think the community, the Kubernetes community does a pretty good job of having mentoring programs. So that's certainly a start, but you know, as Josh mentions, this is a, this is a hard problem to solve for sure. I just want to give space to see if uh, Michael or Maria want to uh, add anything. I can't, I can't speak for Kubernetes specifically, um, but I would just build on what Don said that you really want to try to get to a, a point where you have normalized the culture of mentorship, whether it's through, you know, more formal programs like Google Summer of Code or Outreachy, or just through uh, kind of the way you work on, on activities, you know, pairing with people, um, you know, finding uh, people to co-lead projects with you, um, having kind of an apprentice model set up, anything you can do like that in your community to, to set that up where you don't have that single point of failure um, is a good thing. Even, even just documenting as you go, making sure that you're 
doing kind of what I'd call open source hygiene, uh, you know, making sure your conversations are documented if you have a phone call or, or a voice conversation um, so people can at least refer back to, to the, the paper trail of how things got done. Um, that's better than nothing. It's, it's certainly um, got room for expansion, you know, in, in terms of bringing people along and, and building that culture of leadership. But um, yeah, changing the culture is really a, a, good, a good first step. Um, I love to quote uh, something Deb Nicholson uh, used to say in, in talks a few years ago about uh, handing out titles like they were candy uh, to people. Um, be, in other words, be very liberal with uh, assigning lots of interesting leadership roles and, and making kind of making up new roles for people as you come along because uh, ultimately there's room for everyone to, to take on something in an open source project. Yeah, and I think that there should be mechanisms. And I think someone actually uh, is asking something similar to this. Novik is asking about formal governance. Do you think that formal governance structures would help succession planning? And if new OSS projects should start with a formal governance framework as a foundation? I mean, I I, I think every open source project needs, needs to start with uh, a, a solid governance model. The question is, how can you build in this leadership role uh, into that governance um, to recognize the people who are contributing in this capacity. Because what I've witnessed uh, in different open source projects uh, is that the edits or the contributions that count are, for example, on Wikipedia are the edits to the content or adding content on the wiki projects. On other projects, are these are contributions uh, that are measured in pull requests and, and issues and contributing code mostly. It, we have very solid software to count how many lines of code we, uh, people are contributing, but we don't have the same, uh, the same solutions for uh, counting when people take time to meet with somebody to, to explain how they can join a working group or, or a special interest group. Uh, so how can we build, I, I think it's actually a, a really interesting proposal, how can we build this in the, the governance model of, a, of an open source project in order to recognize uh, this effort as well? The other yeah, thing I, I would think just... that you could do, oh, go ahead, Michael. No, after you, please. Um, the other thing that I think can help with, with governance, one of the things that you can build into governance models is something like, again, what we've done in, in Kubernetes is some of the groups have what they call formal shadows. And that's, it's not, I mean, it's kind of built into the governance and that we have, we have special teams. So like the release team does a really good job of this. The contributor um, summit planning team also does a really good job of this, but having having an assigned shadow or more than one assigned shadow for every single role gives you an opportunity to mentor people. And those people then become release leads in the next, you know, the next one or leads for particular areas for the contributor summit. And that's a really great way to build in this, this kind of concept. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. Um, and and just as important as kind of the formal governance uh, role structure and, and named responsibilities are, um, I think Maria highlighted something that's important for us to remember is that we don't always have good ways of acknowledging those efforts um, because, you know, we're, we're running on, uh, on you know, platforms like GitLab that just count commits and lines of code and things. And, and as a result, sometimes uh, it can do us well to kind of hack together some solutions uh, uh, for example, I've seen people use tools like Discourse and the, the badging system that it has to kind of uh, honor kind of uh, varying degrees of contributions for documentation or community outreach types of activities. And, you know, no matter what tools you're using, uh, find a way to, to acknowledge those contributions in, in some formalized way and make that kind of a practice in your community um, is, a, is a, huge, uh, a huge benefit to people. And it, when people come in new, they see that there's a route for them. If they're not coders, there's a route for them to stay involved and to help move the project forward. So in summarizing what I'm hearing and to answer the question, it the formal governance structure does help with succession planning and having it purposely built into how we operate the community. Now, here's a related question from Ray Paik um, asking, do we have any examples of open source communities with good succession planning that is well documented? We have already touched on a few, 
And I want to add one more question to this. Um, is, is there any examples from small projects or is this only something that big projects do? I don't have a good answer for this, but I think it's actually probably more important for smaller projects to do this because they tend to have fewer contributors. So something like a Kubernetes, somebody could probably pick something up if something happened to somebody. But if you've got, you know, you look at OpenSSL a few years ago um, when when we had, uh, I'm drawing a blank on what it was called now, Heartbleed, I guess. Um, and if something had happened to one of those two people who was working on it, um, that would have been a huge problem. So I think succession planning is actually more important for smaller projects. It's harder, but more important. Um, I don't, I can't think of a small project or big project that has already a good succession planning uh, strategy. It doesn't come to mind right now. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, but uh, I, I, the, the one thing that comes to mind are initiatives to uh, to create the leaders that we want to see in in open source. And one of the the initiatives that I've seen is very solid is uh, Mozilla Foundation's uh, Open Leaders Program. Uh, they let me check my notes. Yeah, in 2016, they started uh, training the different cohorts of people on what it means to to work in the open, how to do project planning. It, there's like guidance even on how to write a readme file for GitHub, uh, and a lot of different tips on uh, how, how to manage events, how to have an event strategy, etc. And this program, I, I was able to take this uh, program as a mentee in 2017, and then I was a mentor in 2018. And I, I think it's a very solid program to to just give the basics of open source and help people understand what does it mean to become a leader and how can you open source your project, whatever your area of expertise is. If it's open hardware, open science, uh, civic tech, etc. Uh, what, how should you do it and why should you do it? Uh, but then this is, uh, yeah, it's a program hosted by an organization that is very, it's advocated to open source. Uh, it's not something that is owned by any one project in particular. So yeah. one of the, so go ahead, Michael. Uh, now just qu quickly to add, I think, um, you need both this this base of leadership skills, and I think you need um, really to look at it on a case by case basis for projects. From what I've seen, it's because it has to fit into the culture that you have, and you have to work with the people that you have, even if you don't have the the ideal lineup of uh, a wonderfully diverse set of skills and backgrounds. Um, you've got to start where you are, and so you need to start really by taking those leadership skills, understanding, uh, really do kind of a, a gap analysis. What you know, what do you not have in the community that you need? and what do you have that people are interested in, in building up for themselves. And really, um, in the OpenMRS uh, experience that I had, um, it was about having individual one-on-one -on -one conversations, seeing what people wanted to take on, uh, what they were passionate about, um, but maybe didn't have those right skills yet. And then we're really developing a plan for each of those people to move into those roles of leadership. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very artistic um, and less of a scientific approach from what I've seen. So one of the things that comes to mind when I think about uh, small projects and succession planning is, um, and this comes from a conversation with a maintainer who has uh, a project that he's basically the only one maintaining it, but it's used by almost every Linux machine out there. And he said he's not worried about the succession planning if something happens to him because the project is part of in this case, it was the GNU project. Um, there are others in the ecosystem that are doing related things. And if you were to go away, someone else can step up and take it over. So even if you're looking at numbers and metrics like 
bus factor. It might be one, but if you consider the ecosystem that the project exists in, it might actually be much better. Um, and especially in these small projects that have a very specific purpose and they do it really well because they've been around for 20 years. Um, that, that's just something I wanted to uh, bring into the conversation as well, that those projects do exist and succession planning is taken care of by the foundation or by the group of projects that they're part of. Yeah, Gary, that's a really good point. It's um, something that we've found in our studies is that not every project needs to grow, right? Sometimes one, you know, one maintainer is, is just fine, as long as you have a plan for kind of what happens when they go away, because you can get some major disruption, uh, or you look at OpenSSL, for example, um, and, and understanding like, okay, what's the risk, what it will look like to transition this off to another, another individual at some point. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a team working on everything, um, but you do need to at least uh, have hopefully uh, given a little bit of thought of what happens if you do get some disruption. Um, because at the end of the day, if you are, are big enough where you have an ecosystem around you, that means people are depending on what, what you're creating and what you're maintaining. So, um, you know, they, they owe it to themselves ultimately to make sure that there is some plan in their mind for what happens if there is uh, some disruption in maintainership. Yeah, and this is another case for making sure that all of the work done in the open source projects is really done in the open so that people can go back and figure out what decisions were made, why that particular architectural choice was, was taken, and, and be able to reconstruct some of that history if, if we had to. So one of the things that comes to mind also uh, with succession planning is what um, Heather was talking about yesterday during her opening keynote, that we need to account for all of the people coming into open source and create healthy communities that are welcoming to onboard them. Um, tools that I've seen communities use are uh, making sure they have a code of conduct where people who come to the project actually know how to, what, what is expected behavior and that it's a safe environment and making sure that we have um, the mentorship in place. We've already talked about that. Um, what are some of the, of the other things that you have witnessed that really helps um, bring in all of those new people coming into open source and helping them step up in the future so that we don't have a succession problem. I hate to keep bringing up Kubernetes, but it just happens to be the most recent project that I spent a lot of time on. But I do think having a really clearly documented contributor ladder that helps people understand how you move up and has small incremental steps on the way to do that can really help. Um, you know, if you look at Kubernetes, like the first bar is to become an org member, and that's that's really low. You just have to do a couple of things and get a couple of people to vouch for you, and that's relatively easy. And then as you do more and more things, you can end up being a reviewer and eventually an approver. And there's a, you know, a really clear documented way of doing that along with a lot of resources and documentation for contributors that really helps. And I think having that kind of step-by-step -step process for people can help a lot to bring people into the community. Yeah, big big plus one on that. I know a lot of the projects that we work with, um, the, well, the first thing we do is uh, we call it kind of a risk coin. One side of the coin is about kind of the engineering work and the software itself. But the other side of the coin, just as important, um, is to understand, do you have a healthy collaborative community? And and like Don said, having formalized uh, kind of a progression ladder, any type of formalized community norms, things for help, to help people get oriented quickly and successfully um, is really kind of a prerequisite to have uh, a healthy, growing, happy community. And if, if we find projects that don't have that, we help figure out, help them figure out what that looks like for them. And get that created and get that well communicated as people come in new. Um, it's just, it's too important to uh, the success of a long-term, uh, you know, thriving open source project. Um, because we really want to tell the whole story. You might have really awesome code, but if you have kind of a toxic community um, that's kind of, you know, buckling at the seams, um, 
people might not catch on to that right away, and they may have some make some pretty important decisions about uh, starting to use uh, you know whatever it is that you're building without understanding that risk. And so we want to make sure that um, the the good code is backed up with a good, healthy, thriving community too. Yeah, I I think to add to to what uh, Don and Michael have said already, um, I think it's very important to to commit as a project to commit to the code of conduct. In a way, it's like saying um, you uh, you're putting efforts into seeing the kind of behavior that you want to see online and. And there are many different ways in which you can enforce this, but I think it's important not only to have it, but also to to enforce it and make sure that people understand this is how we talk to each other here, this is how uh, we treat each other, and this is not this other kind of behavior is not going to be tolerated. Uh, I think having a commitment like that communicates to anybody who is a newcomer: this is a safe space. And we want you to be here. We we want your contributions. Um, otherwise, I, yeah, it, it's it's gonna be really hard to to have people that want to join to contribute if they don't feel that they are treated well. Yeah, th thank you. So Suzanne I posted an interesting question, asking when you look at today's open source community, do you see yourself do you see your earlier self and the newly minted open source contributors? And if I can add on to that, uh, this is a yes, no question, do you see yourself? But if you think back to how you got started in open source, and I, I'm going to say all of us have um, had a progression throughout open source, maybe you can share some of the steps that we have gone through and what has helped us step up and get to the point that we are today. Yeah, so so I'll start, um, Georg, and uh, like you, uh, I started wading into the open source world about 15 years ago, ago or so. Um, and we weren't nearly as sophisticated back then in, in many regards in terms of how well we uh, interacted with other humans. And I was coming um, not from a software engineering background. I, I was studying electrical engineering actually at the time. Um, but so I was perfectly comfortable tinkering, um, but not enough where I knew that I could kind of get in and, and get my hands dirty with the code. And so for me, reading the materials, the documentation that was out there, going back and mailing list archives, uh, were kind of the the common ways of, of trying to wade through and, and find my way in the project to begin with. Um, eventually, we'd end up on things like IRC chat and, and try to troubleshoot questions or figure out how I could participate in some way. Um, so I think making sure you have good resources uh, for newcomers um, remains a, a critically important thing um, to build up a you know a long term. Uh, I hate using the word pipeline, but a long term. Uh, line of people who are going to be advocates and participants and leaders in your project. Um, because they're, those are the people, the people who are coming to your project new today are the people who very, uh, very well may be leaders uh, in five or 10 years down the road. So um, treat them well, um, do your best to help them, uh, you know, more, swim their way through the materials that you have out there. Yeah, I think one of the things that really helped me, like I, I'd been involved in open source, especially on the community side for, for quite a while. But then um, I, I started working with uh, Denise Cooper at Intel, and she started sort of bringing me along to conferences and doing, you know, on panels and and actually speaking at conferences. And that was really sort of when my when my career turned from, you know, just being some random program manager or you know, I don't know, whatever I was doing, sysadmin, various, various jobs, um, to having a lot more visibility. And it was able, I was able to shift my career into, you know, doing the open source community thing kind of full time in a much more senior way. And that I think was, was really important. And so that's something that I've also tried to do with people is, you know, bring newer, newer contributors into, into joint talks or, you know, help, help people along in any way that I can and make recommendations and try to, try to bring people up with me because I think that's really important. Um, I, I I really like the question. I was thinking back to the first time that I contributed something, and I, I do see myself in 
in new contributors. Uh, and if I have to think back, uh, I think the one thing that really helped me a lot was having a mentor. At the time, it was my boss uh, at Wikimedia Argentina who, who taught me a bunch of things about editing Wikipedia. And, uh, and then later on, it was other people. Sorry. Uh, later on, it was other people that showed me the way. And I, I recently was able to find in the Knative community, there is a contributor who's super excited about um, the community aspect of open source. And uh, he raised his, his hand in a, in a number of times and I could see, oh, he, he wants to contribute in this in this area. And so I, I looked him in and I said, can you, can you be a community manager for, for the blog of Knative? I'm trying to put together an editorial team for, for uh, the Knative project blog. And, and so just being willing to, to open uh, your work to others and, and partnering with them and seeing, would you be comfortable with this? And, and if they are excited, then this is the way. And uh, I think, yeah, it, it's important to to be humble in in acknowledging the things that one doesn't know, and then uh, to also be generous and, and try to bring other people on board as well. So we are getting close to the end of this session, and everyone, sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Please head over to Slack. We are going to be in number two community leadership OSPO to do after this session to answer any additional questions and to just hang out there. Um, just a few closing closing thoughts also. Um, do you have any suggestions, next steps, um, or advice to give um, as a closing thought here? And I'm just going to ask Don, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. I think. I think it's important that we need to have these succession planning conversations now before it's too late. Um, in addition to the aging problem that we talked about, where I mean, let's face it, we are in the middle of a global pandemic, right, that could impact any of us. And as much as none of us want to think about that, I think it's important that we start doing things in our own projects and mentor the next wave of people who can take over our responsibilities over time. Thank you, Don. Michael. Yeah, so so in the nonprofit space, we often struggle um, and tr try really hard to get people to move from motivation into action. Um, so I think hopefully we've planted some ideas for all of you here listening um, about how to uh, raise the importance of succession planning. Um, but I really want to challenge all of you to start thinking about specific steps that you can take. Um, so what are the bottlenecks in your communities? What are the risks? What's the long-term vision for your project? Um, because dealing with the issue of succession planning can be a, a good way to kind of wade into other difficult conversations that your community maybe have have put off for a while, such as diversity inclusion or personality clashes or, or other painful issues that might be lingering. So please take this as a, as a call to action and figuring out what your, uh, your community's next steps can be. Thank you, Michael. Maria? Um, I think uh, if I can give one piece of advice, uh, when thinking about succession planning, I would encourage everybody to stop looking at the years ahead and look around you right now at the present moment and ask yourself the question, whose voices are missing right now? Um, because engaging those communities that are not yet part of open source uh, could really bring a lot of new voices and perspectives to open source projects that are much needed. Thank you, Maria. I and all of your advice is super applicable. And I know in my own community in the Chaos Project, I the way that I started the succession planning is to just document all the things that I'm doing and to start a conversation, hey, if someone were to have to step up, what is there that um, they, they would have to do? Um, so just documenting that, having that conversation. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how I personally started this. Now, thank you everyone for participating today. Thank you for our amazing panelists for joining us today. I really appreciate all of your comments and questions in the Q&A. Please 
continue this over in the Slack channel. This is again number two, the community Slack channel. And yeah, I hope you've learned something, taken something away from this, and I hope to see you around in other places. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.